Good morning, and welcome to this Wilson Center Africa program event and webcast on food security systems as drivers for sustainable peace building in Africa, the case of Kenya. I am Sherry Ayers, and I am the communications program assistant with the Wilson Center's Africa program. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, it was chartered by Congress in 1968 as the official memorial to President Woodrow Wilson. The Wilson Center is the nation's key nonpartisan policy forum for tackling global issues through independent research and open dialogue to inform actionable ideas for the policy community. The University of Pennsylvania's global go-to think tank index report recently ranked Wilson Center as one of the top 10 think tanks globally. The Wilson Center Africa program works to address the most critical issues facing Africa and U.S.-Africa relations, build mutually beneficial U.S.-Africa relations, and enhance knowledge and understanding about Africa in the United States. Today's event is held under the Southern Voices Network for Peacebuilding, or SBMP. Established with the support of Carnegie Corporation of New York, the SBMP is a continent-wide network of 22 African policy, research, and academic organizations that work with the Wilson Center's Africa program to bring African knowledge and perspectives to U.S., African, and international policy on peace building in Africa. One of the main components of the network is a research scholarship program. Scholars from member organizations are hosted by the Africa program here in Washington, D.C. for a three-month resident scholar program. The selected individuals complete a policy-oriented research project and engage with U.S. policymakers and practitioners. The scholars share their research findings while simultaneously bringing local context and knowledge into U.S. policy discussions. Today, SVMP scholar Dr. Florence Odawar will share the results of her research project with us. For those of you who are following us online, we are live tweeting today's event and taking questions on Twitter and via our website. To join the discussion, please tweet your questions and tag at Africa Up Close with the hashtags, hashtag food systems and hashtag SVMP. Or you may use the chat function below the live stream on our website. We will also be holding one more SVMP Scholar webcast. This Thursday, August 4th, we will host Herder, Farmer, Conflicts and Food Security in Southeast Nigeria, plugging the gaps in the peace building policy framework with Dr. Hygienus Okibe. Please see the Africa program website for more details. Now, I would like to introduce Mr. Michael Bittrick, the Senior Advisor in the Department of State's Office of Global Food Security, who will set the stage for today's discussion and introduce our speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, those present for joining us today, and, and good morning and good afternoon uh, for those who are joining uh, from, from perhaps in Africa and other uh, places. Uh, thank you, Sherry, for starting us off, and I want to also thank Monde and the team for this vision on food security and food systems work uh, and agriculture that you all have been evoking uh, over the past uh, many, many months. This is not something new to you. Uh, we really, we at the Department of State are really appreciative of the Wilson Center's energy and vision in this regard and think that we are now able to reap some of the benefits of your vision uh, by supporting these kinds of activities. Uh, I write currently uh, as the senior advisor in the Glo Global Food Security Office at State Department. I work for Dr. Carrie Fowler, uh, seed bank and agricultural special specialist of great repute, and it's an honor to be able to work with him uh, and have been doing that for the past four and a half months of his busy tenure uh, on the job. Um, before introducing the speakers and getting into the gist of our discussion today, I wanted to, to really hone in on something that is pretty obvious to a lot of us, but maybe helpful, helpful to bear repeating. Um, in 2015, the intel intelligence community of the United States government took a look at uh, the issue of future drivers of um, um, conflict, the future uh, drivers of political uh, violence, future drivers of economic um, um, tr difficulty. Um, in that analysis, uh, one of the key <laughs> conclusions back in 2015 was that food security was going to be a key driver of instability, political violence globally, and is a threat not just for the United States, but our partners uh, across, around the globe. 
That was 2015. Uh, this last year has bought, brought this issue of food systems to even greater prominence. In 2021, of course, the United Nations, uh, we had the UN Food System Summit uh, that was convened to generate action to transform food systems. And then the Africa Union declared 2022 to be the year of nutrition and food security uh, with the goal of increasing the continent's resilience strengthening its uh, food systems, and working on human development to accelerate human development. Now, the United States has been supporting our African partners th with this vision. Uh, the United, uh, the, our Africa has been working on uh, this long-term transformation effort through um, a, a political vision found in the, the Malabo Declaration and its Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, or CADUP. CADUP is a, seeks to ensure African ownership and leadership across, across food systems and in agriculture in particular. Well, here we have this vision. Here we have a, a clear path forward. Uh, but as a result of uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, uh, and other uh, major contributing factors, we've got uh, a major upset uh, in the region, in East Africa and in Kenya. Food, fuel, and fertilizer prices have risen sharply this year um, and is really impacting global food systems and really heightening the importance of uh, food security as a topic and an issue uh, for, for our uh, politicians. Now, the, in East Africa, the systemic stressors uh, there present, such as COVID, climate-related, uh, and extreme weather, the locust plague, and others have further re uh, weaken regional food systems. So uh, in Kenya in particular, particular uh, uh, the, the, the subject of today's event, the number of food insecure in, agri in, in agricultural areas has actually increased by 48% since August 2021. And while in urban areas, food insecurity has also increased for poor households. The, the linkages, though, between conflict and food insecurity show that while violent conflict is a key driver of food insecurity, per the intelligence analysis of the United States, uh, heightened in food insecurity then contributes to, a, uh, is a major contributing factor to conflict. So these linkages are, uh, can be positive, negatively reinforced or we can positively reinforce force them by sustainable and equitable food systems contributing to peace building. Today's event will discuss the current state of food security in East Africa in general, and Kenya in particular, um, and uh, we'll be examining causes and impacts, but also looking at practical policy options and work that we need to do together. Let's start, I would like to first introduce our, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Danielle Resnick. Dr. Resnick is a, a David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institute and a non-resident fellow at the International Food Policy Research Institute. She's a political scientist whose research focuses on the political economy of development with a regional specialization in Sub-Saharan Africa. She was uh, previously a senior research fellow and governance theme leader at uh, IFPRI and a research fellow at the UN University World Institute for Development Economics Research. She has lived, conducted field work, and engaged in policy outreach in multiple countries, including Botswana, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Malawi, Nepal, Nigeria, Senegal, South Africa, and Zambia. And after this meeting, I'm, after this conversation today, I'm sure Kenya as well. Over to you, Daniel. Okay. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate the introduction um, and the invitation to participate in today's event. Um, I actually started my research career at the Wilson Center as an intern uh, 20 years ago. So it's really great to be back. A lot has changed, um, but a lot has not, including the commitment to high quality, policy relevant research. And of course, the topic of today is incredibly relevant, uh, given that we have these multiple compounding crises that Michael alluded to, but we also have elections uh, in Kenya in the next seven days, which could potentially uh, um, compound some of the issues that we're seeing in the food system. So let me first just try to set the scene, and Michael's already done a great job of this, um, but highlighting some of the uh, trends and dynamics that we're seeing in Kenya. Um, and I think overall, Kenya presents a really kind of 
picture of mixed progress. Um, we've seen some notable achievements, uh, particularly with regards to under five stunting. So according to the Global Nutrition Report, um, under five stunting has decreased from 33% in the year 2000 to 22% as of 2020. So this is, this is lower than the East African uh, average, which is about 33%. Nonetheless, uh, we've seen from the FAO SOFI report this year that the number of undernourished uh, Kenyans numbers around 14 million. So this is certainly not as high as some other countries in the region. Ethiopia, for example, is 28 million. Um, but it's still puzzling given that you know, Kenya has many advantages um, to uh, generate greater agricultural transformation, to uh, address food security, including uh, you know, quite a liberalized economy, uh, democratic system, and, and quite an active um, private sector. Um, agriculture is certainly critical to the economy, accounts for about 65% of the country's exports, about a quarter uh, of GDP directly, and is a source of livelihoods for about 60% of Kenyans. We've seen improved agricultural growth um, since around the mid-2000s. Um, according to the World Bank, this has really helped reduce poverty from about 50 to 40 percent uh, between 2006 and 2016. But unfortunately, uh, you know, in, in terms of some of these broader commitments that the Kenyan government's made, including the Malabo Declaration that Michael alluded to, we're still seeing the country falling short. So the, the most recent CADAP biennial report this year noted that Kenya is off track on 18 out of the 24 indicators um, that it committed to in the Malabo Declaration. Several threats, uh, well, there's many, but we'll just, I'll just talk about a few. Of course, pests, uh, including fall armyworm, aflatoxins, Rift Valley fever, which affects the livestock. Climate change is, is really looming large in the country, contributing to drought in, in what are called the arid and semi-arid lands in the middle and northern part of, of the country. Um, for example, we've seen rainfall been 55% less than average just between March and May of this year. And this, of course, uh, contributes to poor vegetation, less available for grazing for livestock. Um, we've seen thousands of livestock deaths, and milk production uh, has been about 60% below its average. In addition, as Michael alluded to, we have this, this new kind of elephant in the room, which is, is the Ukraine war. Um, you know, Kenya, one of its main staples is maize, and it only imports 2% of its maize, but almost 47% of wheat and 45% of edible oils are imported into the country. And they've been very much affected by, by the dynamics we've seen um, on the global price uh, markets. Also, fertilizer prices, we know they've gone up globally by about 30% since January. And uh, Kenya depends on fertilizer, um, almost 71% of its maize production depends on imported fertilizer. So projections by IFRI actually suggest that as a result of the Ukraine war, we're going to see about a 2.6% increase um, in the national poverty rate. So that's equivalent to about an extra 1.4 million people falling below the poverty line. And there's several other um, issues we could discuss with regards to the food system, such as kind of low attention to uh, domestic food safety, low investment there, that of course has knock-on effects on the, the incidence of uh, foodborne hazards. But I want to kind of uh, take a step back and talk about some of the food security frameworks that the Kenyan government has committed to and what's working and what hasn't been working. Um, I think the advantage we see in Kenya compared to some other countries on the continent is we, we do have leaders who are very much invested in the agricultural sector. Um, both the president, Kenyatta, and his, his deputy, Ruto, um, are, are big cattle ranchers. Um, we know Kenyatta's family has, has investments in the dairy sector, and Ruto is a major maize producer and a horticultural producer. So there's certainly a political will to, to invest in agriculture. And the key frameworks have been the Agricultural Sector uh, Transformation and Growth Strategy, which has nine flagship programs. And then that's been complemented by Kenyatta's Big Four agenda, of which food security has been one of the four uh, main priorities. The main issue you often hear about, though, in Kenya is that there's many plans and programs, um, but the real challenge is implementation. Um, there's many different policies uh, and acts that are lingering in the legislative process. 
Uh, one is the livestock marketing bill that's been intended to create a livestock traceability system and a livestock marketing bill board, and this has been uh, lingering uh, off and on for more than a decade uh, in the legislature and was really, um, you know, the, the challenge of policy momentum was really exacerbated with the Building Bridges Initiative that Kenya, Kenyatta uh, tried to launch in 2018, and that created a lot of political fractionalization um, that stymied some policy momentum. So apparently about 55 bills have been stuck uh, in the parliamentary system. Another challenge is the low investment in agricultural research. Um, only about 0.2% of public ag expenditure as a share of ag value added is going into the uh, ag R&D. And then I'll just stop with one more challenge, which is uh, a difficulty, which has been the devolution process in Kenya. Um, since 2013, after the adoption of the 2010 Constitution, in 2013 you saw the um, uh, effective implementation of devolution, giving substantive functional autonomy in many different domains, including agriculture and livestock and fisheries, to the country's 47 counties. Um, but some of these counties, maybe their incentive is not really to invest in these areas. They have other priorities. And uh, a major, major issue we've seen arise is that each county is wanting to charge its own uh, agricultural cess rates. So as you're moving agricultural products across counties, each county is charging an additional tax, which makes, um, you know, for, for traders um, and for others in the value chain, it means it's more expensive to get food to market. So how do these issues link with peace and security in, in Kenya's political landscape? Well, I think the confluence of drought, um, dying cattle, insufficient vegetation has certainly made conflict more pronounced in the asphalt areas. Um, we, we've seen that just, just just two days ago, there was a, uh, an issue in the Turkana County. Um, it's been exacerbated by the inflow of weapons in the region and believed to be controlled by certain elites in the cities who funnel weapons and, and sometimes benefit and therefore encourage some of these raids. Of course, the rise in food prices uh, creates the risk of social unrest. Um, and, you know, in the short term, we see that because of the elections, we've seen the government have a variety of mitigating measures. Um, but after the elections, um, the real question will be how do we pay for these, as, as Kenya has been downgraded to a high um, debt distress country by the IMF. Um, and this has been further compounded by the rise in U.S. interest rates, which means the cost of servicing Kenya's debts will be higher. In terms of thinking about well, what are some priorities um, for addressing some of these issues, um, and I'm sure Florence will have many others, but I'll just uh, highlight a few. Um, of course, one, we hear it often, um, but it's so true, which is, is staying committed to investments in agricultural research and development and extension services. It's hard to get governments to commit to this because they're not visible. It's considered a low visibility public good. Citizens can't see this very easily, and it manifests in the long term, and they prefer short-term subsidies. Um, but to really get you know, more productive agriculture in the country, um, we really need to be investing uh, more in these systems and perhaps thinking about public budget tracking that can help keep counties accountable in this and create citizen demand. Um, secondly, of course, is improved land security. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the, the biggest challenges, um, but certainly one that, that needs to be addressed. Um, there's been some discussion of better mapping of the different types of land tenure systems, the public, private, and the communal land tenure systems, uh, thinking about introducing quality grading uh, for, for livestock and building abattoirs closer to the pastoralist uh, communities so that they don't lose out on price transmission because they have to, to uh, rely on traders to take their, their cattle um, to further abattoirs. And then finally, this, this issue of the multiple taxation um, really need a consolidation of these agricultural taxes through an agreement with a body like the Council of Governors in Kenya, um, ensuring that there are fair prices given to all actors in the value chain. Tanzania did this uh, a few years ago, consolidating its cess rates and using an electronic system. So there could be some really important policy lessons to learn from, from its neighbor. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Daniel, thank you for this intervention. Uh, really laid an excellent framework uh, of analyses and look forward to uh, the Q&A uh, for sure. I um, would like to, uh, before uh, turning over to the next speaker, I wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, for on our Flo uh, Florence uh, ODR is uh, a Kenyan uh, Southern Voices Network for Peace Building Scholar who is here uh, as also a lecturer in School of Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Environmental Studies at Arongo University, as you heard. Her teaching work is centered on sustainable value chains, 
food supply chains, food security, post-harvest systems, public-private partnerships, and project planning and management. Dr. Odior's research project here at the Wilson Center is focused on linkages between conflict, food security, and opportunities to build resilient food systems uh, in Kenya. With, uh, and without any further ado, Hasante uh, Sana, Karibu. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, as uh, you've just been told, uh, I want to talk about food security systems as drivers for sustainable peace building in Kenya. And I'm narrowing this approach down to the case for Kenya. Now, to be able to link um, a, a peace and food systems, this is really about the nexus, the food system peace nexus, which uh, really implies that uh, when disruptions in the food system happens, that then there are ensuing devastating consequences for food security, and these are key elements for for conflict. And the reverse is also true. Now, the disruptions or failures in the systems has caused a lot of conflict in the country, most parts of the country. And I'll just give you a few examples, as my colleague has already mentioned some. Uh, but there has been persistent drought. Actually, there are um, reports generated right from 2020 that drought has been consistent up to today and because of this drought there is loss of rangeland, rangeland resources and because of this pastoralists have to drive their, their cattle to greener areas to be able to look for pasture and as they do this they are moving into farming communities and because of this they create tensions and conflict and violence and all this leads to uh, destruction of property, people are maimed, and there are also deaths that arise as a result of this. This is happening majorly in the arid and semi-arid lands of Kenya. And uh, remember that 80% of the Kenyan land is arid and semi-arid. So we are only talking about 20% of Kenyan land that is arable, that has adequate rainfall for farming. Another scenario where the food system failure has resulted into conflict. There are inequalities and marginalization. And again, this happens much in the marginalized lands where um, a lot of uh, communities lose their livelihoods. And as a result of loss of livelihood, for example, we have situations where, like now, uh, uh, cattle, there is extreme death of cattle as a result of, uh, of the drought. Cattle are dying in masses, and families or households are left with no livelihood. And these are situations that bring about uh, a, a conflict. Uh, land resources are sometimes taken away from people, and they feel uh, that their livelihoods have been taken away. They are agitated to get into conflict. And uh, again, this is happening, especially in the marginalized sections of the country. We have a lot of inequalities, uh, in, uh, gender inequalities, inequalities that are working against the youth, and this bring discontent, which can easily and usually sometimes have brewed conflict. Um, reduction in the agricultural output and, of course, the spikes in the high food prices has brought conflict, even currently as we are speaking, there are a lot of social media protests against the government on the rise of prices. And people are demanding that the government needs to do something about this. And this is an indication that if nothing is not done, then conflict can arise. People can move into the streets, riots, and of course we know what happens as a result of that. Um, the food system, of course, has contributed to youth unemployment and we know that youth employment is a recipe for conflict because we have idle youth, we have youth who are frustrated, and they are left there to be targeted for use by politicians who want to settle their political scores, uh, youth who are targeted by extremist groups like the Al-Shabaab across the, the border in, in Somalia, and of course the general insecurity in the country. And what are the efforts that have been made by the stakeholders of the food system in the country. Now, Kenya is a country in Africa, and the leading voice in Africa that is uh, trying to concentrate efforts on building resilience or of the resilience in the food system is the African Union. And we know that the African Union has committed uh, to 
building resiliency and improving food security through the Malabo Declaration and even through the Comprehensive Agric uh, African Agriculture Development Framework, CAD. And Kenya, as a member of the African Union, of course, is obligated to be able to meet these targets. Um, the government has also made quite some commitments to be able to strengthen the food system and, of course, to promote food security through implementation of policy frameworks and development goals. And some of them, for example, we have the Kenya Constitution that um, makes um, food security uh, a right for every Kenyan. We have the Kenyan Vision 2030 also that makes the food security uh, uh, agenda a right for every uh, citizen. Uh, we have the Agriculture Sector Transformation and Growth Strategy of 2019 to 2029. We have the Kenya Nutrition and uh, the Kenya Food and Nutrition Security Policy of 2012. And the government is trying to, to change and transform the food situation through these uh, policies. Then we also have a lot of development partners on the ground who are trying to build resilience of communities and carrying out several activities. Um, for example, we have USAID, you have UN uh, uh, um, uh, uh, bodies like Food and Agriculture Organization, we have the Food World Food Program. We also have other organizations like World Vision, they are on the ground trying to build resilience of communities and also to uh, uh, carry out uh, humanitarian services. Um, and so a lot is going on. A lot has been achieved. There are lots of successes, but these successes have not been adequate. A, li a lot still needs to be done. And what, why have these uh, efforts and actions not worked? These are some of the reasons. Implementation of the strategies have been slow, and uh, because the government has failed to achieve its financial commitment under the Malabo Declaration. Actually, by 2021, it's, it's only been 3.2% against 10%. That is way below the, the requirement. Then efforts to achieve progress have been slow and insufficient. Insufficient because of the more challenging and uncertain context in which the country is finding itself and this has been mentioned, like we have situations arising that, that were not there before. We have the COVID-19 that just came and broke the supply chains. Um, uh, uh, populations were landlocked and, uh, and uh, work was not going in the, on in the agricultural sector. We have Russia-Ukraine war that has made the cost of inputs to skyrocket. Uh, again, the cost of foods to skyrocket. Kenya is an importer of wheat from Ukraine, and this has not been possible as a result of the war, and so it has exacerbated the situation. Uh, we also have other climatic shocks. We have the locusts uh, uh, upsurge that have affected the country in the recent few years. We have uh, new pests and new diseases like the Folami worm that have emerged, and the country has not yet found um, solutions to this kind of catastrophes. So this has made uh, the war, the, uh, the, the, the efforts to be able to curb uh, insecurity a little difficult to achieve. Another problem that we have is that the local commodities, food commodities, are facing stiff competition from cheap exports from other countries, especially Asia and, of course, some uh, 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 nations in the European uh, continent. And because of this, agricultural structures are being abandoned, and because of this, farmers are getting weakened. But we also have external factors that are b becoming a barrier to the achievement of some of these objectives. Economic policy pre prescriptions by the World Bank and IMF that demanded that nations in Africa reduce aid and subsidies to farmers. This was done in Kenya. We have inappropriate lending by the World Bank where uh, the, the, uh, uh, the nations in Africa and of course Kenya turned out to have to be very so indebted they could not be able to, f to pay back their debts. And so they were forced into structural adjustment policies and these policies forced these nations to be able to cut spending on agriculture, and that includes Kenya as well. 
And we have the current situation, which is global inflation, which has been caused by a lot of factors, like the increases in prices of fuel and, of course, uh, Russian by the, because of the Russian-Ukraine war. So what are the lessons that you can be able to learn from the Kenyan food system? There are several, but I, I ju I'll just pick maybe a few, one or two. Uh, Kenya, we need to know is that is one of the countries that are, are acutely at the worst risk of food insecurity. And that is according to FAO. In the FAO's index for um, global hunger, Kenya ranks 87 out of 116. It's almost the last. So Kenya is at a, a very bad situation. Then undernutrition or undernourishment is rising in the country. But this is what I want to say, that agriculture is uh, dominated by smallholder uh, uh, producers, smallholder farmers, who make about 75% of the total food producers in the country. Now, these smallholder farmers, their average age is 60 years. Now, they face a lot of constraints. They don't have access to uh, uh, adequate inputs. They don't have access to finances. And as a result, of course, together with several other constraints, they are unable they are faced with underproduction and underinvestment. Uh, women are ma the majority of smallholders. In this uh, percentage of 75, majority of them are women. And women uh, produce up, up to 80% of the food supply in the country, the food that feeds the entire nation. But these women, together with all the other constraints by, that are faced by other smallholder farmers, they have added constraints, for example, they have low education, and as a result, they are unable to adopt uh, te new technologies and existing technologies. Women do not own uh, property like land and other resources, and so they lack collateral to be able to access credit from financial institutions. Women also cannot access adequate input or improved input. And apart from that, they bear heavy workloads as well as reproductive roles. And all these factors diminish the productivity of these women. Another uh, scenario of the food system in Kenya is youth unemployment. Agriculture employs about 75% of the labor force. Now, out of this 75%, uh, we have said that majority of them are 60 years. That means the youth are left out. So the youth have been marginalized by the food system in Kenya. And as a result of this, we have youth who are idle, youth who are frustrated, youth who have nothing to do, and they are left at the mercy of politicians to be used to settle political scores because they are given a little money, a little handout, and then they go to the streets and kill and maim and loot and, and, and carry all sorts of conflict. They are idle and frustrated, and so extremist groups come to to recruit them into, ex into, into terrorism. And once they are taken to Somalia, of course, they are turned into the terrorist group and they become uh, um, terrorists who are able to attack any part of the world. Uh, apart from this, youth unemployment, uh, because we have a lot of youth who have nothing to do, who have no livelihood, they become a threat to the security of the nation because they are there uh, robbing people and uh, and mugging people uh, uh, and killing and uh, and uh, and um, and robbing and so there's generally high sec insecurity levels in the country as a result of this and so because of these situations I am recommending that the food uh, that the government and of course I'm appealing to the international community to be able to help the government to do this set uh, food and agriculture for peace hubs. And this is a facility to strengthen uh, the production and the, the delivery system uh, efficiency of agricultural inputs and self service delivery systems to smallholder farmers. And this can be done in several parts of the nation and made to be context specific so that the smallholder farmer can be able to be strengthened and to be made resilient against all the shocks that are taking place and to be able to increase their productivity. Secondly, I want to make a recommendation to the government of Kenya. This is solely on the government to try 
every means possible to promote agriculture uh, beyond its current performance by increasing its budget allocation as prescribed by the Malabo Declaration. And this will be able to enforce or, or enhance agricultural development activities. Number three, I want to again make a recommendation to the government of Kenya, but appealing to the international community to also come in and step up the effort to promote education, agricultural education, and expand training uh, for the food system by taking advantage of the demographic dividend and open up tal uh, talent pathways to be able to bring training in skills that uh, open up professions for the food system. And as they do this, the youth should be lured, uh, incentivized to be able to join agricultural activities even as they are trained to be able to carry out activities and professions in the system. Uh, when, we, uh, we are, when we do this, then we are carrying out activities that as much as we are going to promote food security, but then there are also actions that will be able to bring uh, a, 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 a sustainable, sustainable peace, lasting peace, because if we don't do this, then we are living a situation where there will be no stability. Thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, Sante Sane, Sana, um, Dr. Oduar, a really moving uh, presentation, and I think we needed to have a little bit more, so we allowed you a little more time to lay out the vision to, and some of your policy recommendations, and I think it was worth it. Appreciate uh, your energy, your dynamism, your vision. Um, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to Q&A. So we've got some uh, questions. Uh, possibly in the audience here, um, and we have already received some online. Uh, so would like to see if anyone here in the, in the house has any uh, opening volley for our, for our panelists. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm Gitacho from Ethiopia. Uh, really, it was informative uh, presentation. Uh, for both of you presented really very interesting mm -hmm. and uh, really current issues in Kenya and the Horn of Africa as well. I have two questions. Uh, the questions might go to both of you. Uh, and the first one is basically associated with the Ukraine war. Uh, you have indicated that um, the war has affected uh, adversely the food security of Kenya. Uh, so wha wha what's your uh, recommendation, particularly in relation to uh, domestic food uh, safety, uh, s food self-sufficiency in Kenya? Uh, because if something happened in other part of the world as well, it's, it, it affects Kenya in, in terms of this, this issue. And the second one is um, uh, to um, Dr. Florence. Uh, you have indicated that there is inequality in terms of use and gender has uh, implication toward this food uh, security or insecurity in Kenya. Can you say something about the gender inequality? You have indicated about the use marginalization as a major problem of violence in Kenya. What about the gender issue uh, in relation to food security in Kenya? I thank you very much indeed. OK, um, yes, I'll talk briefly about the Ukraine war. Well, of course, this is the, the question every country is asking about how, how, to, how to react, how to deal with the food price inflation. Um, and I think what it reveals is you know, a lot of structural weaknesses we knew were in the food system uh, globally, um, and, and a lot of the challenges within the African region, which has about 60% of the world's uncultivated arable land. Um, so so much potential for you know, greater uh, greater food security um, in the region. Um, and I think it goes back to, uh, you know, the call that both Florence and I made about, uh, you know, shifting the balance of investments towards uh, research and development um, and extension services and not simply on um, the subsidies for, for inputs. Um, 
Uh, I think there's also a major opportunity to, you know, increase consumer demand for more domestically uh, grown grains, such as sorghum. Um, uh, millet in, in, in parts of West Africa is really key. Um, you know, the, the challenge a lot of the region faces is that you've seen a 32% increase in population growth in, in Africa uh, since the last food price crisis around 2007-2008, but you've seen a 68% increase in the demand for wheat in the region. And a lot of that is because you've had rapid urbanization, urban transformation, and a lot of urbanites prefer to eat wheat-based goods, eat the bread, eat pasta, et cetera. Um, but I think there's real opportunities to, you know, pr be promoting amongst consumers the advantages of a lot of these domestic and, and indigenously grown um, grains as well, like sorghum, et cetera, um, and to um, in invest in research in, in high, you know, high yielding seed varieties um, through through the research and extension system. So that's that's one. It's, it's something that's been repeated uh, many times um, in the agricultural community, and yet it's it's one of the most intractable issues we see because we we really need to get public demand for this until people see the benefit of you know investment um, in ag R and D. I, I don't think politicians will have the the incentive to do that, particularly in, in democracies where you're looking for your votes. I think so much I'll answer the second question. Um, I think I talked about inequalities and uh, in my scenario uh, about the, uh, the, the, the Kenyan food system situation, I say that uh, we have smallholder farmers, m many of them are women. I think I've brought out how the women are marginalized as they face uh, a, a lot of constraints that diminishes their, their contribution towards the productivity. I've also talked about youth, and I say that the food system has marginalized youth. They have been left out. Then marginalization also comes in uh, where some uh, members of the country cannot access food, and while others have got access to all that they need. So that is again brings about marginalization. Um, poverty is, is 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 a factor that brings about marginalization because me people cannot meet. Their, life, their needs, they have no access to, to food and other requirements. And of course, we have a high popul uh, another uh, category of the population who, are, who have more that, than they need. Actually, Kenya is one country where the gap between the rich and the poor is so big. And so this is another factor of marginalization. There, there are several issues that we can be able to bring up, but I think that is enough for now. Very important reminders and focus. Thank you uh, for the question. Thank you for the response. Yes. We have a question. Or, yep, right here for the mic. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Okibe Hygiene Zibanku, <laughs> a scholar with the Wilson Center, who, of course, um, will be making a presentation on Thursday. I'm um, going to discuss the uh, issue of uh, the pharma conflict as it affects um, uh, food security and looking at uh, the policy gap. Um, the presentations you have made are quite apt, uh, very, very illuminating. I so much appreciate uh, the insight I have gained. Mine is not a uh, a question, just a comment. Um, the comment relates to the observation I made here concerning uh, the remarks um, about um, constitutional provision in Kenya, which has made food security a right for every citizen. My experience about African uh, constitution making and the provisions revealed to me that um, there are several hypothetical statements that are just uh, made in the Constitution which are not realizable. There are no structures and institutions put in place to implement them. These are just ideals and not a reality. Um, I, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not certain that um, uh, making um, food security a right in a Constitution is, is the appropriate way to tackle uh, challenges relating to 
uh, food issues and uh, poverty. Uh, what is um, required in this context is that the uh, African leader should brace up to the challenge of uh, providing uh, for the citizens, even when they are not expressly stated in the Constitution. Most of our leaders uh, transform sensitive issues to politics, and uh, that has become common. Uh, during the elections and the campaign, all these things uh, come up. And when people congregate in terms of uh, making constitution and making some proposals on how to transform a society and bring it to a better you know, state, they usually just uh, come with all these uh, lofty ideals, which of course um, at the end do not um, serve any purpose other than just uh, being um, expressed as part of uh, the objectives of a nation. So um, in part of uh, the advice you will be given, I also look at um, a comment in that area where, of course, you have to challenge government. It is not enough to express this opinion in a paper. It is uh, actually sufficient for somebody to engage in a tangible action that will bring all these things into limelight. Thank you. A good time to reflect on the right to food. It is an uh, internationally debated and nationally debated item for a number of countries around the world. Thank you. Um, Joe McAndrew uh, with KRL International. Um, first off, thank you both uh, for your presentations. Uh, they were very informative and, and very, um, very insightful. You both mentioned um, the effects of the fertilizer shortage on um, the food security crisis in the region. And I was wondering if you could expand on, uh, you know, why you think that's happening and uh, what practical steps can be taken to address that. And also, um, Dr. Resnick, you spoke about, um, or you alluded to the possible effects of the Kenyan election on food security in the region. And I was wondering if you could also expand a little bit on your thoughts on that. Um, okay. Um, well, on the fertilizer shortages, um, I mean, the real issue is Russia's the, you know, it is quite unique in the sense that it has all three major uh, kind of nutrients that are used in, in, in world fertilizer. It has the potash, the potassium, and the nitrogen. And Africa depends heavily on nitrogen and potash based fertilizers. Um, and, you know, actually, there, even before the war, uh, Russia was putting a, a ban on um, a, a quota, an export quota on its, uh, on its fertilizer exports, um, as was China. Um, so, of course, you reduce the supply. Um, well, there's still high demands, then, then the price goes up. Um, so so that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, outside of North Africa, Nigeria, and South Africa, most, uh, most countries on the continent do not domestically produce their own fertilizer. They don't have the, the facilities to do that. Um, and even if they did, you, you really require fuel to process fertilizers, so the increase in fuel prices affects that as well. Um, so you have these, you know, these compounding effects that have really um, created the shortage and, and created the, the increase in um, prices for fertilizer. Now, it, it's disparate, right? So, some countries in the region um, had actually already stocked up on fertilizer but before, before the war happened, and so they, they will be less affected um, than ones that, that did not. Um, with regards to the Kenyan election, well, I think there's a lot of positive signs that we will um, hopefully not see, uh, you know, the horrible violence that we saw in, in 2007 uh, with those elections. A lot of, um, you know, um, early warning uh, services have been put in place. Um, but um, it is conceivable that if one of the candidates does not conceive or if there's concerns about the credibility of the Independent Elections and Boundaries Committee uh, Commission, uh, you know, is put into doubt um, that, you know, we could see uh, violence on the street, um, including by some of the youth that, that, that Florence was uh, alluding to. Um, and so uh, I, hope, I hope that's a far, you know, a, a far-ranging scenario, but it is conceivable if we did see electoral violence, that has knock-on effects for, for food security and, and economic livelihoods more broadly. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think I'll just uh, comment about uh, the elections a little bit. Uh, on the, f the first question, I think, has been answered. 
uh, I think every time there's a change anywhere, people are always hopeful. And so I think uh, Kenyans are just hopeful that things will change for the better. But, uh, I th but uh, we can't say for sure what is going to happen as of now. Um, every time there are elections in Kenya, Kenyans are always very apprehensive because there are always indications of, of violence. So we are hoping and praying that this time such scenarios will not be repeated. Yeah. But as for any change um, towards transformation of the food, uh, uh, food system, we are just hoping that the best will happen. Yep. Thank you for that question and appreciate a very thoughtful responses uh, from our panelists. Um, Dr. Resnick, this is a, a question from the audience <clears throat> online. Dr. Resnick mentioned decentralization as an additional factor in Kenya's food security landscape. How could Kenya enhance coordination across levels, national, subnational, and with the AU? We'd like to start with you, Danielle, but we'll turn it over to Florence too, because I know she's got some thoughts. Uh, so go ahead. Okay. Um, and, and probably probably have more <laughs> detailed thoughts than I do. Um, I mean, uh, Kenya does have coordinating mechanisms in place for this. Um, one I alluded to is the, the Council of Governors. Um, one is the, the Joint Ag Sector Committee, the JASCOM, um, that comes together um, both across minister, you know, horizontally across sectors and, and vertically as well. Um, but of course, you know, one of the challenges is, like we'll see next week, we'll have a new crop of governors, we'll have a new crop of senators, parliamentarians, uh, members of the county assemblies, which are part of the legislature at the county level. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it is just kind of beginning from scratch um, with a new crop of leaders in terms of lobbying on particular issues, um, identifying ways for, for greater um, coordination on, on issues like the agricultural assess, on things like the um, uh, better coordination with what had been the big four agenda in terms of what ag priorities were chosen at the national level and, and whether or not they correspond with what the counties were choosing as well. Um, so this is, this is not just specific to Kenya. We see a lot of countries in the region face this challenge where you give greater, uh, uh, you want to enhance local democracy, um, at, but then there's trade-offs with national strategy making. Um, so Kenya does have these mechanisms in place, um, but the challenge is really kind of keeping that momentum across elections. Um, and, and one solution that's often advocated is kind of ways to, to, to engage and target kind of mid-level bureaucrats who will remain in place despite some of the, uh, you know, the transitions at the top when you have the turnover of the politicians. So finding your champions uh, within the bureaucracy who will, who will stay longer term. You've nailed it. Yes. Lawrence passes. Very good. Excellent response. Next, next <laughs> question. Uh, if Kenya needs to make more progress on fulfilling its progress in the Mal Malibu commitments, which one should be prioritized? to make the most progress on the food system sustainability. Uh, Florence, I want to start with you. Um, now, Kenya made a, a com uh, as a member of the African Union, um, made, uh, signed the commitment to, to these targets. And uh, because of prescribing to them, then they're obligated to be able to, to meet these com the commitments. So Kenya, of course, is ne not the only country in the continent that is lagging behind. Several others uh, are, but uh, I think Kenya really needs to make a step forward and try to move towards achieving uh, these targets of the African Union because they are meant to, to be able to facilitate the development of agricultural actions all the way in the food system. Thank you. So, sounds like you're trying to encourage engagement of the mid-level bureaucrats now to make sure that we can have transition. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, great. Um, very helpful. Um, we should also say that uh, if you, for those who are not familiar with the CADAP scorecard, um, there actually was a case where uh, Kenya did slightly above average than other countries in Africa. Um, there was only one country, one out of... 50, 
that passed the CADAP score in this uh, last uh, biennial review. So it's uh, a place where there, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> um, next question comes a question from uh, the executive director of Sango at Kenya, Catherine Gold, Goldfarb. Uh, how do women smallholder farmers play into improving the overall food security status in Kenya? I think, Florence, you've answered that for the most part, but uh, you'd like to just okay. do a little bit of addition. Yes, um, we have, uh, 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 we mentioned that uh, a, um, um, a lot of the f food producers in Kenya are women and they are smallholder farmers. And uh, we've also mentioned that smallholder farmers face a lot of constraints that hinder uh, their, their increased production. But we have also said that on top of the, what the other smallholder farmers are facing, women save, face several other constraints. And these constraints, it is not themselves, they may not be able to get out of these constraints on their own. They need support. And this is wha wha what we are bringing here, that can we be able to support the smallholder women farmers in Kenya to be able to, uh, 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 to have the means to be able to carry out uh, enhanced productivity for enhanced food security because whatever they are producing is so much and if they can be um, helped, they can be empowered, then it therefore means that this tr will translate into more increased food production and of course translating into food security for the country and therefore peace. Yeah. Just to add that I think um, it's important to also recognize the, the role of women in the food chain off the farm. I mean, they're really critical in terms of informal food trade, um, in terms of fruit and vegetable trade, dominating a lot of the in informal markets that you see in, in urban areas. And they really cannot operate in, in ideal working conditions, um, often you know, very poor um, sanitation, drainage facilities, um, lack of shelter. Um, that is both not good for human health, but also erodes the quality of a lot of the goods they sell. So I think also investments off the farm um, are really key in market infrastructure. Just to follow up uh, on small holders, follow up on small holders, uh, very important uh, recognition here the, of the small hold, holders work in, in, in Kenya. What share of land do they control? And uh, is their tenure secure? Is inequality in land holding a factor in food security? Uh, oh yes. Uh, I, uh, women are not, um, okay, the, the constitution, the new constitution, we still call it new constitution, um, now allows women to own land, which was not the case previously. But culturally and traditionally, women are not allowed to own land, they're not allowed to own property. Uh, whatever land they're calculating, they're cultivating belongs to their husband. The property that they have belong to their husband, husbands. And so um, they, are hin they, are, they are hindered. This hinders you know, their economic um, well-being because they have nothing to themselves, they don't have collateral, they're unable to be able to obtain loans and credit from financial institutions because these institutions want um, collateral so that they know that they are safe even as they give their money. So women are marginalized in this matter. They are, um, uh, 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 they, they are made poor even, even in terms of income. Women do not receive income sometimes. As much as they work so hard, the money, if they at all comes in, it never goes to them. It goes to somebody else. So, so there's a, uh, a lot of marginalization for the women in the food system. And this really needs to be mitigated for the system to be able to, to be strong and to be resilient. Thank you. Uh, another uh, good follow-up question here to uh, Dr. Odiwar. Uh, you mentioned, talked about peace hubs in the community. Uh, have you seen in a difference in the communities with these peace hubs, and uh, how are young people, um, how are they brought in to make sure that they can be successful and better establish them? Um, when I'm talking about peace hubs, I've said that uh, they are a facility that are put in communities 
where smallholder farmers can be recruited into so that they are helped to be able to access inputs and and maybe helped to access finance, um, a, a training training uh, and, and skills, and a skills transfer can be done to them. Um, they can be provided with every other thing that they need. They can be mitigated against shocks in, every, in, in different communities so that their resilience is built up and they are able to continue uh, producing and be able to enha enhance their productivity and they can be able also to withstand the shocks that have been common in the, re in the, in the recent past. And uh, when you talk about youth, I talked about um, giving incentives to youth to be able to join up agriculture professions and activities. And uh, I, first I talked about training that needs to be expanded. The training in agriculture has been, um, ha has, has, has been reducing. If you talk to any agricultural training institutions in Kenya and even universities, you'll find they're closing up courses which are related to agriculture and the food system. And this should not be so. Because if the youth are not included, then it means our food systems will not be sustainable because uh, in the, uh, as, as, as we continue along the years, there will be natural attrition and our food producers who are an average of 60 years will soon all be gone. And when they are gone, there will be no personnel for the food system. So we are saying that if we want to have sustainable food systems, then the youth must be included and this should be as should be done as urgently as possible. Thank you. I have a uh, follow-up to that point because on a previous Wilson Center event, one of the Zimbabwean uh, wo woman, a uh, farmer, entrepreneur, um, raised the very important point and salient, uh, how can we make agriculture in Africa sexy again? That was the challenge she laid out um, for for Africa. Florence, do you have some, and I, mean, I know that Dr. Danielle will also have some thoughts as well, but Florence, any thoughts on how to make uh, agriculture sexy to the, the African public today? Thank you, thank you, Mike. I think uh, the big question and the big answer still begins with resources. And uh, we are urging the government to increase the budgetary allocation to agriculture to be able to meet the targets that they were committed they committed themselves to but other than that we have said that um, there are a lot of ch challenges that have just come up and this have not been programmed by our government and because of this sometimes resources are not adequate and our appeal, therefore, will be to the international community to hold the hands of, of the government, even as they are putting up initiatives in place to increase budgetary allocations and also come in to provide support, whether it's financial or technical or in any other way. Thank you. Um, well, I was, I was just kind of, uh, I guess, chuckling with that comment because I think more than a decade ago I was at a conference in Ghana and I heard a, a <laughs> someone ask the same question, how do we make agricultural sexy again? Um, and, I mean, this is going out, outside of Kenya, but I do think um, we haven't learned very much from a lot of, I think, government efforts in the region to create, um, you know, youth employment and agriculture programs. Um, many, many countries have attempted to do that. Um, what have we learned? Is it attracting youth back? Um, you know, what are some of the pitfalls that they see? Um, and you know, alternatively, has COVID shifted some of the, the thinking about this? We saw a lot of enthusiasm for you know, the variety of apps and technology that came about in the food system. Um, you know, a lot of features on Twiga Foods and, and Jumia um, and other types of, of uh, technology applications. Um, you know, has that kind of increased, uh, you know, greater attractiveness of, of the sector, um, at least on the kind of marketing and, and, and sales side of the food system? Uh, clear, clearly underlining we're in a really key inflection point for food systems. Again, attention of think tanks like the Wilson Center, and, and, uh, and it's not just 
philanthropies, and I mean, sir, it's not just governments here, it's not just regional organizations, it's philanthropies, it's non-governmental organizations, it's the private sector itself s- stepping up in some cases to start to deliver and, and make, uh, and multilateral institutions such as the Africa Development Bank. Um, the, another follow-up question, I'd like to follow, see, hear, hear your response. Um, uh, in regard to the climate crisis, how do you see this impacting food insecurity and, and the dimensions, other dimensions of the, the crisis as you see it, but I specifically focused on the climate? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the climate uh, situation is, um, is a crisis, and I think uh, voices are heard everywhere all over the world um, talking about climate change and its effects, and this is not different in Kenya. In fact, the effects of climate change in Kenya are quite um, um, uh, 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 serious. And uh, just like we have mentioned, um, we have persistent droughts. Um, year in and year out, we have flash floods that come in and destroy uh, farms and crops and, and, and leave um, um, farmers with nothing. Um, we, we, uh, and of course, reduced amount of rainfall, as, as Daniel indicated. Uh, but we are saying that um, I think there is need to come up with very strong and serious efforts to mitigate the effects of, of, of climate change for the country to be able to move forward in a sustainable manner by carrying, bringing in technologies that will be able to stand against climate change. For example, I think that there are, pr- that, that there are programs to develop um, climate smart varieties of, of, of several products like sorghum, uh, you know, pr- varieties that can be able to withstand uh, drought. They can th- they'll be able to survive under uh, low rainfall, and such kind of um, actions are are in place. But I think um, they need to be strengthened. They're not adequate. They're not enough. And of course, any other technologies like water conservation technologies and every other technology that can help the country to be able to withstand climate change, I think will be really helpful because it's a situation that is out of hand. Yeah, so we just need to bring in uh, actions and, uh, and situations that will be able to help the population to be able to move on in a sustainable manner. Thank you. Great, thank you for a very thorough response. Um, getting on to uh, an easier question. Um, given the, uh, the continued conflict, uh, Russia-Ukraine um, is ha- impacting the overall system, there, there will be a situation in which uh, six to 12 months from now, there not only will the climate impacts, not only will be their COVID impacts, but uh, there will be new planting seasons uh, what are some practical things we can be? Th- we've already li- mm-hmm. we've already given us some practical ideas. Looking ahead to these next uh, couple planting seasons, maybe a two e- two to three year l- intense lens of effort is going to be needed. We're expecting uh, because of the current situation. Uh, what are what are some additional practical steps to support in this 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 these planting seasons to come in Kenya? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, important step will steps number one will be to really support the farmers uh, by subsidizing or on the required inputs. That's a, that will be a very big step because once the prices have shot, then it means that the farmer in Kenya cannot afford them, and if they are unable to afford them, they will plant their crops without. And you know that if that happens, then we will have no harvest or no, adic- no, no proper harvest. So support should be given towards subsidizing inputs and fertilizers as, as much as possible. Um, another effort will be to encourage the farmers to use other m- technologies like use of... Um, Organic, organic methods. 
of nourishing the, 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 uh, the, the soils, like using organic fertilizers. This will also really help to be able to drive the agenda of trying to promote productivity. Yeah, thank you. And support your local sorghum developer to ensure that they have more resilience. Oh, yes, 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 sure. Just another plug for you, Florence. Sure, um, sure. Anything else? On yeah, I mean, I, I think Florence said it well. Um, I would just add, um, you know, I think some subnational um, kind of mapping of uh, which areas are expected to be the most affected, um, and and because there are different planting seasons as well in the country, um, uh, you know, just because the the subsidy approach is very expensive um, for the government, um, and uh, as we as we were advocating earlier for them not to. Uh, you know, spent so much on subsidies given the need for, for uh, investment in research and development as well. So identifying, you know, where are the areas that are most going to be most affected and um, uh, trying to target those areas with support rather than just a blanket approach um, to, to these input approaches. Um, so that's a plug for, for more kind of subnationally uh, uh, focused, um, you know, whether it's economy-wide analysis of the impacts or uh, kind of partial equilibrium uh, analyses. The, uh, as a moderator, I'll also make the point about some of the response to the Russia-Ukraine crisis. Um, this this war, which uh, is totally unnecessary from the perspective of the United States government uh, and and several other global actors today. Um, is causing a major Im impact, as we've already mentioned here. The United States, in response, is seeking to put the right effort forward, uh, not just politically uh, and diplomatically, but also with major investments, uh, sh short or immediate, short, medium, and long term on the food systems account. So the United States has come forward and is providing uh, over $1 billion to prov in the short term to provide uh, assistance to the food assistance humanitarian needs in Africa. That th Those funds are going to be uh, for not just the Horn, but also Sahel and other parts uh, of the continent. The United States also is seeking to provide uh, subsidies on fertilizer. Uh, recognizing how grave the crisis is right now. There will be an effort um, by the, U the U.S. and like-minded to provide additional support to ensure that the fertilizers, especially in the low-income countries, so that the farmers have these inputs in the next 6 to 12 months. This, this, uh, the numbers uh, we can provide uh, uh, offline, but they're, they're very specific, and we're seeking to uh, ensure that they're made available there's also the United States government is looking to increase the short, as I mentioned, the short-term humanitarian assistance, but also the longer-term assistance. Uh, the Kenya is a Feed the Future country. Uh, a lot of the support that the U.S. has provided over the past decade um, has been through the mechanism of Feed the Future. And those inputs have been multifaceted, everything from the, s the smallholder support, gender, F uh, focused activities, um, subsidies when necessary, support for the tra uh, ag, ag trade um, and ag-led growth. Um, those inputs are going to continue and be increased, especially, again, given uh, the impacts of the, uh, the Russian uh, uh, r war. I want to make sure that was understood as we discuss the way forward um, because it is going to be resource, resources going to be very important. Um, the United States government recognizes that and, and appreciates the frontline work that is being done here um, and will continue to, to continue to press for additional resources to be made available. Um, another question from the, the moderator for you. Uh, we've made clear that this, this work and effort on food systems is really not something just for the ag minister. I think we've heard about we have a few other ministers we probably need to invite to this conversation. <laughs> uh, those would include the trade minister, the education minister, a youth and gender minister need to be in the room. The uh, uh, environment minister needs to be in the room. And probably most importantly, the finance minister needs to be in this room. Any reflections on this? How? 
um, can we, as a, as a community, work together to get all of these, in the case of Kenya, get all of these um, in the room. Uh, we will be supporting this transition. It's upcoming. It's kind of a key time. Um, how can we make sure that we can galvanize and get the, the longer-term support uh, through in a, in a multi-sectoral, multi-ministerial way? Over to you, Florence. I'm sure, Daniel, you'll have something, but Florence, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, um, building up the, the food system is really not uh, a one-man agenda. It cannot be attained um, independently, but uh, it will be an it will need an inclusive approach where we have all the stakeholders that have um, that need to carry out uh, activities or performances within the food system coming in and discussions and engagements involving all the stakeholders, all the the, min the, the ministry officials, governments, and every other person because you know the food system is complex. It is not just about food production. There are many other issues. We have education. We have gender, like uh, Michael said. We have um, uh, we have we have uh, uh, finance. We have you know uh, labor and and all that. And all these stakeholders need to come in and speak with one voice so that we can be able to strengthen the actions that we are talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a critical issue that we've been facing for you know a year since this UN Food Systems Summit um, as well, about how do you bring different ministries together, um, particularly because ministries do not like to sacrifice budgets. They don't like to sacrifice their responsibilities. Um, and they, ha they have different constituencies that they're responsible for, for as well. Um, I think, um, you know, for in the, in the Kenyan case, I think um, I'd recommend continuing to support something like the Ag Transformation Office, um, you know, supporting a food systems transformation office, and, and that's in the office of the presidency. I know it's the ATA is very tied to Kenyatta, so whether it will be retained, uh, you know, depending on who his successor is, is a big question. But I think pushing for a, a kind of high-level office within the presidency where you have the different ministries coming together. Um, they potentially have performance targets um, that they, that they need, each need to meet, and then therefore they have kind of joint uh, accountability and responsibility um, you know, for delivering on, on targets. That's fantastic. And uh, yes, I forgot to mention the Minister of Health. Nutrition is a critical part of this. I didn't want to leave them. Oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> Local governments, critical. <laughs> Um, etc. But yeah, we, we are very important to have that uh, multifaceted approach. Uh, the, we're really at a time we need to wrap up. Uh, lots discussed, overwhelming amount of information and ideas put out by uh, both of you. Um, would like to get your last, uh, as you're reflecting on this conversation, um, in, in about a, a minute or so, can you give us some last bottom line ideas for, for next steps and how we can, um, you know, together as a community ensure success. Um, just hi highlight key points um, from your conversation um, and uh, so something for us to, as we leave today, to reflect further on. Thank I you, think, Florence. Um, thank you. Um, maybe what I will say is that uh, we have uh, reflected on the, on the food system issues and uh, we have seen that uh, they are uh, uh, the, 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 that the food system can be a driver for conflict and we are saying that uh, if you wanted to bring stability and human security on a sustainable basis then we need to take quick actions that we have just reflected on today to be able to strengthen our food system and uh, promote food security so that um, we en enable our people to be food secure, to promote human security, and of course, uh, regional security, national security, and international security. Thank you. Thank you very much. Asante sana. Daniel? Yeah, so my, my own view is that um, we can give lots of policy recommendations and diagnoses for what's not working for the ag transformation, offer many more resources, um, to get through these crises, but 
um, I really think without understanding why we have bottlenecks to implementation, um, a lot of these recommendations could fall short yet again, like we saw after the food price crisis. Um, so I think my, my own view is we really need to take a kind of 360 degree view, kind of looking at what are also bottlenecks to implementation. Um, and you know where we need to couple our focus on agriculture or food systems with a broader public sector governance uh, focus, looking at where there are incentives and uh, accountability um, coming from both public sector, private sector, and civil society to deliver on uh, these many commitments that both nationally and internationally uh, we've seen in this area. Well, this has really been a lot of a uh, lot of in incredibly insightful and thoughtful and experiential, um, con you know, discussion here today. And, and I hope that we can will not leave this conversation. We want to continue this conversation. Um, there are many stakeholders, uh, both here present in the audience, but also uh, online. And I think that this is one where it will be up to all of us, whether we're coming from government or we're working in the private sector or we're in the, in, in the academic community um, or a philanthropy or non-governmental organization. It's really going to be all of us working together that can help affect this crisis and time in ways that are not only looking at the short term but also the longer and, or medium and longer term. So um, just to, to summarize, some of the conversation is completely impossible uh, as the moderator, given the, the depth of the experience and ideas that you all have propagated. Uh, I will hit a few uh, and, we'll, um, and then we'll, we'll conclude. Um, we have, uh, we've decided that it, we need a multi-sectoral approach and needs to be supported um, so that it can get through the Kenyan governmental transition. This would be something that would be broader, not just for Kenya, but for governments across the continent, that there needs to be an institutional plan in place to ensure that these, uh, these policies, programs, and efforts are institutionalized uh, in sustainable ways. Um, s this support of the Ag Transformation Office and it's, is, is an interesting and important one uh, for Kenya. The uh, issue of, um, of re research and development has been brought up several times. This is going to be a place where a number of our stakeholders come together like the philanthropies, the NGOs, think tanks, um, academic community, um, in, in the United States included, um, and there are opportunities to scale that up. Kenya is a member, um, there aren't many uh, in Africa, of the, Afri uh, the, uh, sorry, the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate, or AIM for Climate, that was uh, put together by the U.S. and the UAE in two th during the COP26, um, and that, that initiative seeks to transform climate smart agriculture through a massive external investment uh, targeted and focused and and there it is meant that the uh, not, this is just not the private sector it is meant to be led by governments um, as a key stakeholder the Kenyan government actually was one of five countries in Africa that has part of the initiative and it's basically uh, decided to put emphasis on uh, ag R&D for climate smart agriculture. So that, does, that is to say that uh, the finance minister needs to apply some resources <laughs> and the ag agriculture ministry then needs to ensure that those are made available uh, for these longer term efforts. This is an area uh, where the US, USAID, US uh, Department of State uh, and USDA are working together to provide a uh, vision and next step support for um, Kenya and, and other con uh, countries in Africa. Um, but it's, it's mindful of the need for this political, um, it's, it's aided greatly by this political level commitment. The same commitment you have, as mentioned, in CADIP. The resources, and a third point is that we need to resource the priority, which is smallholders. And that is increasingly, increasingly a smallholder that is a woman and that is, or that is young. 
and how to ins determining the maybe we have the wrong incentive structures in places um, trying to determine how to try trying to overturn those incentive structures and re repurposing and galvanize greater support uh, so that 10 years from now we're not having the same conversations um, as we are having today to motivate we are in a key inflection point, as, as uh, Monday has mentioned, uh, as the Wilson Center has ma uh, made very clear. Uh, this inflection point gives us all an opportunity to do things differently. And also, um, fourth, improving land security and land tenure is a key aspect of this. Um, it's one of these that is oftentimes not um, thoughtfully undertaken because it seems too difficult, too hard, uh, but ensuring that not only there's a gender right approach, but also ensuring that uh, land tenure issues are, are thoughtfully undertaken, uh, maybe at, uh, at local levels to the best extent possible, and then ensure obviously a national level, um, you know, important for the national level to be tracking. Uh, we fifth idea that we heard about is these uh, peace hubs, food and agriculture peace hubs might be something that can be um, undertaken to ensure that they're at the local levels where there are unique conditions um, that are undermining security, both food to security and peace and security, to ensure that those are, have, a, have a, th a thoughtful stabilization approach, ones that are appropriate, not necessarily, not necessarily to be cited and determined by uh, in Washington, but really thoughtfully Nairobi working with the, the local communities um, as it can, and allowing those local communities to make decisions uh, that will promote their sta stability. Um, talked about technologies subsidizing uh, in the in the short to medium term. The committed the, the ideas here are that we need to, the the international community needs to provide additional inputs to support the fertilizer shortages and and shortfalls and the, not just short <laughs> not just fertilizers. It's uh, the other inputs are also including um, information and t uh, technical uh, knowledge transfer. So, um, would like to, as we close, um, would like to provide an, uh, just thank, first of all, I want to warmly uh, thank the speakers for their presentations and uh, all, all 10 of you in the audience here. Thank you. Um, I would like to. Um, we'd. <laughs> I have an advertisement, as our brothers already mentioned, we have an SNVP event uh, that will also be held uh, on Thursday. Reminder to that, that will be August, that'll be August 4th, Thursday, uh, from 10 to 11.30. Um, and uh, our scholar, um, Dr. Okibe, will be present, and also uh, Ms. Liz, Lisa Inks from Mercy Corps will be speaking on herder farmer conflicts and food security in Southeast Nigeria plugging the gaps in the peace building policy framework. Um, please visit the Africa program website for more information. Um, thank you again to our speakers and thank you all for joining us today.